everyone, and welcome to Bridge to the Galaxy. I'm Tanis Coughlin, uh, Galactic Ambassador with the Alliance for Extraterrestrial Diplomatic Contact, and I'm joined today by our guest, Kevin Briggs. Kevin, welcome. Oh, well, thank you, Tanis. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, without, without people like yourself and uh, your podcast, I can't get my message out. So, uh, and uh, it's important that I do get the message out. So, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I do appreciate it. Well, it's it's such an honor that you joined us today. I'm so pleased. So what I'd like to do is um, have you maybe tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now, and then we'll get into your story. Okay. Well, I'm uh, uh, for those viewers that don't know me, I'm an experiencer uh, from the age of eight, and I've had contact with different extraterrestrials, a group of eight extraterrestrials, uh, all my life. The first two when I was eight, then I was introduced to another six when I was 14, and I had contact with them all my life. So I'm now working towards uh, communicating. I understand now that the experiences are the emissaries for the extraterrestrials. Uh, so I'm working towards that, working towards some maybe uh, hopefully get some legislation passed, though, where we're allowed to speak to the extraterrestrials openly. And uh, so that's where it's led me to today and I mount meet with another group of experiences exoconscious humans who are have all the abilities and contacts that I have and now we're working together as a small group and uh, hopefully moving the communication uh with the extraterrestrials into the main public arena really so that's that's what I'm working on at the moment but it's been a long story to get there it's a long story I bet. I bet. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, how you got started? I'm sure the first, your first experience with them was probably a little bit shocking. It, it was actually, it frightened me to death. But before I tell you about that experience, if I, I that journey actually started when I was three years old. Uh, my mother had engaged a photographer to take some photographs for the family album. I was duly washed and had my hair combed and, uh, uh, the photographer arrived and uh, he lifted me up onto the uh, oak dining room table for a better elevation for the photographs. And from that elevated position in the room, I looked around and realised I was conscious again in a physical body. And I was actually looking out from the physical. My conscious energy was looking out, looking around the room, and I was aware of So that was my first encounter, really, with my own consciousness, my own a new physical body as well at three years of age. And I still have that photograph. In fact, I think I, I put it in my book. And uh, But the first encounter, I was eight years old and I was taking a bath at home and uh, I, I felt a change in the frequency within the bathroom. And as a child, I was always um, susceptible to the different frequencies that were around us. And uh, I looked to my right and two beings appeared. Uh, or both human in appearance, one male, one female. They were slightly elevated off the ground, up to about six inches. But, and uh, they were both very attractive. Both had long, blonde, shoulder-length hair, deep blue eyes, which were very deep blue, and then a, a blue jumpsuit-type garment. Uh, and as you see, fight me to death as an eight-year-old. And uh, the female... They weren't talking to me. They were talking about me. And uh, the female said to the male, is this the boy? And the male said, yes, this is the boy. And then she questioned him again. She said, are you sure this is the boy? And look, look at him. He's small. He's uneducated. And he's frightened by our presence. And she was correct. I was terrified. Uh, he's an heart. That's his name. The male. He said, yes, this is the boy. I will guide him. I will teach him. There was some other conversation. Uh, and then they left. And as I say, I was so frightened. I didn't get out of the bath. I didn't move. And mother came in to see why I was still in the bath. I told her about the two beings, and she said it was just my imagination. Well, it wasn't. Uh, I've been in contact with them all my life. And uh, Art and Dee uh, were true to their word. He's educated me throughout my life. So I've had lifelong contact with them. So that's the beginning of my journey. Beautiful. So what kind of education did that involve for you? The main thread of the education is one of consciousness itself and shared consciousness, uh, not only with the, uh, 
and the human species, but with the plants, the trees, the animals, the earth, the planets, the other species that uh, we live and share in this universe. Uh, so it's really one of understanding consciousness and how it can be used for communication, for travel, for healing, for education, uh, for creation and co-creation. And all those things we have the abilities to use and utilize consciousness itself for. And they give me an understanding of uh, uh, how consciousness exists in the uh, materialistic world that we live in at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, the whole education as being one of understanding consciousness. Awesome. So what kind of experiences did you have? You must have had some some fascinating well, yeah, after interactions. The, uh, <laughs> after the, the first one at eight, uh, it, I was, it was about a year later. Uh, I, it was a, I remember it was a Sunday and uh, I had some friends around. I was nine years old and uh, we finished playing and uh, it was time to go home for their tea. So uh, I showed them out the back door, and as I turned around, there was a, uh, I could feel that change in frequency within the house, within the home. So I went looking for it, I went into the living room, I went upstairs into the three bedrooms, bathroom, I went back down to the living room where it was strongest, and I was uh, drawn towards the curtains, the drapes, and uh, I looked behind the curtain, and there was uh, an orb there, orange orb, about four to six inches across, orangey yellow in colour and slightly vibrating. There was no communication uh, with me at that time, but I was a bit concerned because I thought I brought it into the home and if my mother saw it, I might get into trouble. So I thought, well, when I go to bed this evening, it won't be there tomorrow. I went to bed that evening. I woke up in the morning and I knew instinctively it was still there. I went down, it was behind the curtain. Anyway, to cut a long story short, it was there for a whole week. Oh, wow. Uh, each time I went to school, I thought, oh, I hope it's going to go up get home. And it was always there until Friday. I came in about 4.30 from school. I opened the back door and I realised it had gone. And uh, I went to the curtain and looked behind it and it wasn't there. But from that date onwards, I was able to uh, separate my conscious energy from the physical reality, from the physical body and go and travel as pure conscious energy itself. Uh, so uh, I didn't have any uh, lessons with that all. I suspect that he activated something in within my DNA that allowed me to separate my conscious energy just by thought, by thinking about it, by where I would want to go. And initially, I just used it to, to go and visit my grandparents who lived about 70 miles away in Liverpool. And uh, on a Sunday, I'd just relax, have the thought that I want to go over there. I would fly over there, as it were. I'd see the house. I'd go into the roof. I'd go into the bedroom upstairs. They had a dressing room uh, on the master bedroom. And I would sit in a chair, uh, looking down through the floor, and the floor would be opaque. And uh, my grandmother would usually be in the kitchen cooking on a Sunday. My grandfather, either reading the newspaper or watching the TV. And it gave me great comfort to do that. But at that time, I I always thought, I wonder what they would see if they came upstairs and came into the bedroom. I know the answer to that now. I didn't then. Uh, the answer would be, they would see my pure conscious energy orb, which would have been four to six inches round, slightly vibrating, orangey, yellow in colour. They never did come upstairs, but uh, I that was part of probably one of the first lessons of understanding consciousness itself and how it can be separated from the physical realm that we create using thought and consciousness as well. It's all part of the education, but the education, they didn't sit me down in the classroom like they do with some experiences that I've met. Uh, all my education was through an experience, and that's why I like the term experiencer, because mm -hmm. I learned by the experience uh, that they gave me. So... Uh, so that was the next stage when I was nine. So it, it must have been a challenge having those kinds of abilities as a teenager, going through that, those those tough, pure, pure conscious years. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you should say that. I can tell you a, a quick story about that when I was 16, 17, 18. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, uh, if I just go back a little bit, before That's that, good. when I was 40, if I just, if I keep it in chronological order, uh, I can tell you what the next stage was when I met the other six. At 14, I had a paper round. And uh, every time I went out in the morning to do the paper round, a UFO would appear above the house. And then as I was walking towards the, the store to get my papers, to collect them, uh, another UFO would appear. And they would follow me around the paper round until I'd finished. And then one would go back in the direction it had come from, and the other one would just go straight up in space. And that was a regular occurrence. And then I, while I was there and I was doing my paper round, I was always aware that there was someone behind the wall, behind the hedge. Uh, so on one occasion, I plucked up courage and I said, I know you're there. Can you show yourself? And these two small grey beings stepped out from behind the hedge, behind the wall. And uh, I said, I wasn't frightened. I said, oh, what do you want? And they said, oh, well, there was a group of people that want to meet with you. And I said, well, uh, I said, uh, I've got my paper round to finish and then I've got to go to school. Uh, I can't go with you. And they said, well, uh, you can finish your paper round and then we'll have you back in time for school. So I finished my paper round and I agreed to go with them. So I was taken physically to what I think was a mothership. And the reason why I thought it was a mothership because when we flew into the hangar, uh, it was huge, absolutely, it was like a football field. And uh, in there were all these different craft that we see flying around the planet Earth, whatever, people take these blurry photographs off. Well, they were all there, all these. And mm -hmm. I was led into a door, down into an amphitheatre. And as I walked down into the amphitheatre, it was full of all these different beings sat there. And at the front was these uh, eight beings. Two of the beings were Ort D, the male and female, that materialized in my bathroom when I was eight. And then the others I was introduced to. So the first two was Ort and D, they're at Julian's. And then Arna, she was like a blue bird type being. And then Zara, I come to got in, know him quite well. He's a small grey. He's an engineer, mathematician. He designs propulsion systems. And he has three offsprings. And uh, he messes around with my wife's stuff around the home. He moves them. He likes teasing her and things like that. <laughs> then Ra, he was sat in the middle. Huge amount of energy he had. Uh, he was Anunnaki. And he leads this group. And then there was a tall grey. He was Tar, that was his name. And he told me that he was responsible not only for the uh, security of this group of eight uh, beings, but he's also responsible for the security of the, this quadrant of the galaxy. And I never thought about the galaxy being separated into quad quadrants. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Chica, he was a mantis being. And I was a bit perturbed by him because he was six foot tall and just looked like a big grasshopper. And then lastly was Orla. She was a tall white. I think she told me she was an astrobiologist. And uh, she had a very pale complexion and her hair was translucent. And uh, I thought I was there then just as a, uh, a human specimen to be paraded. I realise now that wasn't the case. That was a council, a galactic council. And I'm sure there are many, uh, I'm aware now, that there are several different councils uh, all working together with uh, different experiences uh, to help evolve humanity uh, through consciousness itself. So we can evolve as a species. So that's where we're heading. But that was when I was 14. So uh, just a little jump each time. They're never giving me anything that's too far removed from me to be able to understand it and accept it. And uh, I've never been fearful of anything. I've always opened, uh, opened my mind to it because I, I, was just, I was curious as a child. And I always wanted to know more. But when I got to 16, 17, I would just travel outside of my body at will. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. When I used to get up from my apartment and go to work, I'd walk out the door and I could walk to two different bus stops, different directions. And sometimes I'd get there, there'd be a line of about 30, 40 people. Uh, so I thought, oh, I should have gone to the other one. So what I used to do, I'd come out of my apartment, I'd leave my body, just nip up to see which line was the shortest, and then walk down to that line. So I just use it like advantages. that. Advantages. <laughs> yeah, advantages, yeah. Or in those days, we didn't have cell phones and I didn't have a phone in the house. So if I was going around to friends, I had to walk around to see if they were at home. So I'd just leave my body, nip over there, nip in through the roof and see where they were, whether they were at home or not. 
if they were at home, I'd, I'd walk around and then we'd go out. So, yeah, like you say, advantages. But to me, it was normal. I thought it was just another a sense that we had, like touch, taste, seeing, hearing, and uh, out-of-body travel. Normal. <laughs> and uh, so, so I asked my family, I asked my friends, but I asked in a third party because I wasn't fully sure. And I said, I've got a friend of mine who travels outside of his body. Uh, do you know anybody that can do that? No, no. And the answer came back, no. Nobody knew anything about it. So one evening, I uh, asked Art. I thought, well, I know there's a lot more to this. Uh, I'll go to bed this evening and I'll ask Art to come and show me more. <laughs> so did you get a lot of your teaching then uh, in the dream time? Uh, yes, I think I did. Uh, <clears throat> Some of it was in the physical. Mm -hmm. There were many modalities of contact, and I've probably experienced them all. And again, those modalities of contact, uh, of experience, uh, are part of the education. I know when I uh, I decided to ask Art, uh, I went to bed that evening. I think I was about, I know where I was living at the time, and I lived there from 16 till about 19, I think. And um, uh, I held out, I went, went to bed, I relaxed. Of my mind, I held out my hand and I said, uh, Art, I know there's a lot more to this, a lot more information. Can you come and show me some more? So uh, he came, he took hold of my hand. I left my body. Bear in mind, I'm used to doing that on my own. I've been doing it since I was uh, uh, nine. And, uh, and it, it, I looked down, I could see my body was still asleep and I was holding his hand. We went out to the window, we just flew around the subdivision and then uh, came back into the window, and I could see my body asleep, and I went back into my uh, physical body. I woke up the following morning thinking, wow, well, was that a dream, or was it real? I wasn't certain. So I thought, I'll try the same thing the following night. So the following night, I did exactly the same process. I relaxed, I opened my mind, I asked Art to come and show me more. I held out my hand. He came, he took hold of it. I left my body, I looked down, I could see it asleep. We went out through the window, only this time we went down into Leeds city centre, where I lived at the well, lived in Leeds. And uh, in the Leeds city centre, I recognised the town hall, the hospital, the university where I worked as a technician at the time, and all the people in the streets milling around. It was uh, uh, a very uh, vibrant nightlife in Leeds. So the streets were so busy. We came back to my apartment through the window. My body was asleep. I went back into my body. So the second day, I thought, I'm still not certain that I'm dreaming or whether this is real. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'm going to ask him again for the third day. So I went through the same routine. But when he came, he took hold of my hand. I left my body. I said to him, uh, can we go out to the roof this time? So I said, I'm not certain whether I'm sleepwalking or dreaming or what's happening. But, you know, my apartment's three stories up and it's concrete pavement below. I'm not quite happy about going out through the window. Can we go out through the roof? We went out through the roof. And then all subsequent journeys together, uh, we went out through the roof and, and travelled together. As I've been travelling since 14 on my own, uh, yeah. and I could go anywhere, just through thought, using consciousness as the conduit for the travel, which is part of the education. And uh, so that was the introduction of travelling outside of the body from uh, with someone else, which interesting which broadens your horizons which makes you have a, a greater reality than what other people see because once you expand an understanding of consciousness and utilize it it opens up a whole new world really so yeah absolutely and so you went on to be a police officer you were saying i did when i uh, i mentioned earlier i was a technician at the university of leeds yeah. I was there for about 10 years or so, 11 years maybe. And uh, I decided I wanted to change in career. And uh, I applied for the West Yorkshire Police. And I was accepted. And I was a police officer until I retired. So, yeah. Um, How did so that I, go with these abilities? I bet that would have been a very interesting blend. Uh, well, it uh, it taught me a lot of skills. I and mean, the police officer job is not an easy job. It's a very yeah. difficult job. So I got a great education in communication, which is quite interesting in relation to what I'm doing now. I'm communicating my stories of the contact and consciousness and understanding uh, through probably the educations 
in relation to communication because you have to be to be a good police officer you have to be a good communicator or you did in in the uk because mm -hmm. we weren't armed uh we just had a wooden stick in those days when i was a police officer so you talked your way out of things you calmed things down you were um uh, a negotiator with people of all different walks of life and under all different influences you know people in drugs drunk things like that people angry people are violent uh so yeah it, it gives you a a good understanding of people but now i realize that i'm using those communication skills to uh help uh, share the message about the extraterrestrials over here mm -hmm. so what other sort of uh interactions did you have that stick out for you that were okay well when impactful. i mentioned about art coming on those three occasions uh, it came to me on uh, the one of the occasions. Uh, again, I, I just asked him and uh, turned up. And he says, Kevin, I'm going to take you somewhere special tonight. Will you go with me? I said, yes, I'm quite happy to go with you. Uh, so we went out through the roof. Uh, only this time, we just kept going up and up and up and up. And I could see the earth in the background getting smaller and smaller. Not unlike the photograph behind me, behind me now. The earth was blue. It was nice and big. And then it got smaller and smaller and smaller as we went higher and higher. And we went into another dimension. And when we went into that dimension, there was a line of people there, 30 people. At the front of the line was my deceased father. Uh, he was stood up, he was six feet tall, and I had never seen him standing before because he was always in a wheelchair when I was born. Mm -hmm. And he greeted me with a beaming smile. And he said he was going to introduce me to my uh, family members going back 30 generations. And uh, the feeling of love, that emotion of love, the feeling that emanated from that group of people was almost overwhelming. It was just huge. Anyway, we went down the line. Uh, my father introduced me to each individual and they showed me their last incarnation, what they did while they were down here. And then we got to uh, halfway down the line, about 15th person. And instead of seeing a physical shape, I saw a pure conscious energy orb, orange, four to five, six in, in, in diameter, slightly vibrated. And, uh, but then they showed me telepathically what their last incarnation was. So I went down the line, came back up the line, and then uh, uh, Art said it was time to leave, so we left. And then uh, we went and visited them again and, and again. And then I got so used to visiting them with Art I was able to do that on my own. And again, the experiences that I had taught me how to do that. So I would go and visit them on a regular basis over a two-year period on my own. Just visit as you would with your aunts and uncles and your grandparents here in the physical realm. And, uh, but they always wanted me to stay with them. Every time I said, I'll have to go now. No, no, Stay with us, stay with us. No, you don't want to go back down there. I said, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I'm enjoying myself down there and I've got things I need to do. Uh, and, I saw, and I was finding it more and more difficult to leave them and to get back into my body. So I decided one day at work, I remember looking out the other window while I was standing there looking at that window. And I thought, well, I don't think I'll have to go back and see them again because of what I'm explaining. And, uh, but, I cannot just not go back. I'll go back tonight and I'll let them know that I won't be coming back to see them again. So I went up, relaxed, I opened my mind, I went to see them. Uh, again, this feeling of love was just overwhelming. Just Everybody was just so pleased to see you. It was just amazing. And uh, I had the conversations, and, uh, as you would visit with normal family members here. Mm -hmm. But then I told them, I said, I won't be coming back now because uh, of the reasons I mentioned. Uh, and they still tried to persuade me to stay. And I said, no, I have to go. And I haven't been back since. But I know they're still there. They're still alive at that higher level of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, down here in the physical, we have the lower levels, and that gives us the, the reality, the solidness of, the, uh, of what we see, which is real. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but there are different levels of consciousness. And depending on where you are at that level, depends on your life on what you're doing so uh, uh quite a a big lesson that and because mm -hmm. i understand that and i know they're still there now if i wanted to i could go and visit them uh, but i don't need to 
I've done it so many times over a two year period. Uh, it's just part of the education that when the physical dies, we just continue on as pure conscious energy. But I already knew that anyway, because I'm able to travel like that anywhere I want to go now, because I'm able to separate that consciousness from the physical. Won't you leave the physical behind? You can go anywhere, you know. So we, it's like a symbiosis of consciousness and the physical reality that I'm able to separate the two. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's true. You know, I mean, we talk about this being real, but really that's very real as well. And that's oh, part oh, of that education, doubt. you know. I mean, we talk about this physical reality being real, but it really all of it is real. And that's yes. part of that's part of the education. I feel like, you know, you and I and others like us are here to to bring forward is that it's not just what's here in the physical. There's way more to it. And yes. so and it, it's not separate. It's all one. Yes. It's just whether you are able to access it, and that's the key. And that's where we need to evolve as a species in relation to understanding that. And then we can go and travel uh, as our extraterrestrial families do. But they also have the physical as well. They can travel in the physical. But uh, I, I very often when I was growing up, I would go and meet on the, on the astral plane. I would mm -hmm. leave my physical body, go onto the astral plane, and meet them there. And uh, I know on one occasion, I uh, was just traveling on the astral plane just because it's pleasurable to leave the encumbrance of the physical body behind and the physical realm. Uh, and I'm just flying on this astral plane. I don't know where I was particularly going that, that particular day or night. But uh, anyway, they, Art and D came alongside me in a craft. And the craft oh. itself was conscious. It was conscious energy. They invited me onto the craft. And uh, as I went through the skin of the craft, I realized that it was conscious. I could feel that conscious energy. When I went inside, they uh, uh, said they got a message from somebody. Would I convey the message? So they gave me the message. I said, yes, I would. And uh, and then uh, I said, well, before I leave, I'd like to, can, can, I, can you explain something to me? I said, if I explain what I'm understanding, and if you can confirm it to what they were. And I said, well, here I am, traveling on the astral plane as a human being outside of my physical body. You come along as two other beings outside of your physical body uh, in a conscious craft that you've created, and I see you as two pure conscious energy orbs. Uh, how do you see me? They said, Kevin, we see you exactly the same. And my understanding of it, again, the experience was the education. I'd already got used to seeing orbs when I met my deceased families. And uh, uh, so it's really just the next step within my own education in relation to that reality of who we are as a, a species and meeting with the, the beings that are at the higher level of consciousness. And, and that's really what they've that what they've done. They've educated me in all the modalities of contact using conscious energy uh, that they use. And that's what makes me a good emissary for them. Because when I'm speaking to them, uh, if you're speaking to French people, you need to be able to speak French, don't you? Or if you're speaking to German people, you need to speak in, in German. Well, I can uh, understand consciousness reach those higher levels of consciousness and communicate with them in their language because their language is the language of consciousness itself. Right. So because it's consciousness, you don't need to know a language per se, like French or German, right? It's like... Exactly, because... It's, it's all time. energy. It's energy itself. The energy, the communication is carried on the wave of the energy. And, and they, they give me scientific downloads to explain that. So I have an understanding of it as well. Uh, in fact, I've spoken to a couple of leading scientists in relation to uh, that. And my understanding that they've given me is in line with what our leading scientists understand of consciousness at the moment yet. So uh, with a little bit extra in relation to all the modalities that it can be used for. I was going to say, I'm sure they have a little bit more understanding than ours. <laughs> 
we're getting there. We're getting there. We're doing well, yeah, but yeah, yeah, we, got, we, got <laughs> we have some progress to make still. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's really, um, it, but it's normal to me because I've been yeah. brought up with it and been educated with them. Now, my brother, he's uh, he's retired now. He's an aircraft engineer. He had an excellent job in his own business at one time. He flew all over the world repairing craft and things, aircraft. And um, but he, he knew of my experiences because I spoke about them as a child. He didn't have any himself, so uh, he doesn't have all any of these abilities. But he's he's now learning some of them actually. But uh, um, because he was taught how to repair aircraft, you know, large aircraft, seven four sevens. Uh, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. <a> clue. <laughs> because I haven't been taught. So really, it's just a matter of education. At the end of the day, uh, sit down in the classroom or given experiences. And uh, I mean, if you if you had a fault with the 747 and you just phoned my brother up, Mike, he'd say, oh, yeah, that's so so. Check this, remove that and change that. Well, I won't know what to do. But uh, And it's as simple as that, really, because we are an intelligent species. We just confine ourselves within our own thoughts, within the limited education system that we have. And we need to expand that. The, and that's what you're doing with your being you know, a galactic ambassador. That's what you're doing. You're sharing the knowledge, sharing the information and expanding those people's consciousness who are interested in learning more about who they are, why they're here, what's the mission, do they have a mission? And all those things that consciousness understanding. Uh, it, it, I, I believe I have a happy life because I connect and interconnect with everything that surrounds me because I realize it's all part of my consciousness. I sit under, I've got a, a huge sycamore tree, and I sit under that in a chair. And I'll sit there for half an hour or so. I'll have my dogs by my side, and uh, I just sit and watch what's going on around me. There's a whole life, a whole plethora of things happening that we we don't see, because we don't take the time to see it. I know I sat there a few months ago, and I saw this big grasshopper. I know I mentioned the uh, chica being a mantis being. Yeah. And I saw it. I'm sat there in this chair and I saw this grasshopper. And and I knew sometimes I have a knowing things that are going to happen sometimes. I call it a knowing. And I knew this grasshopper was going to come and land on me. I just knew it. And it was about 20 feet away. And it, it leapt and came towards me. And I looked at it. I said, I know you're going to come and land on me. Then it, it jumped to the side about six feet. And I thought, no, yeah, and you're going to come and land on me. It jumped back to the middle, and it jumped again and landed on my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I looked down at it. I said, I knew you were going to come. I knew you were going to do that. And then uh, it started walking up up my, uh, up my chest. And I had an open neck shirt on like this. And I said, I don't mind you coming and seeing me, but don't go up on, into that open neck. I said, go up and sit on my shoulder, and you can sit there as long as you want. And it changed direction and went and sat on his shoulder for about five minutes and it jumped off. But that's just a small example in relation to uh, seeing what's going on. That little grasshopper was part of my uh, consciousness. And mm -hmm. the fact that I knew he was going to, did I create the fact that he jumped on me because I'd created the thought? I suspect so. But they, the. Communicating. You were, you were communicating with them. Communicating with them, yeah. And I mentioned way. my brother. I've got a very interesting story with my brother. He, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, he was an aircraft engineer, a nuts and bolts man. He retired, I think, four or five years ago now, and him and his wife moved down to Spain. He sold up. We were in the UK. And then uh, I speak to him regularly on the uh, uh, phone and uh, by Zoom or whatever, FaceTime. And uh, he said to me, oh, Kevin, he said, you see butterflies down here. They're huge, absolutely huge. And we have butterflies in the UK, but they're not really big. And uh, I said, oh, I said, well, why don't you ask the butterfly to come and land on your hand so you can have a closer look? He said, oh, they won't do that. I said, well, why don't you go out and ask ask one? Uh, so I said, well, indulge me. So he went outside. He's got a balcony. He's on a, a, a hill, and it overlooks the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And uh, I said, right, next time a butterfly comes past, hold out your hand like that. Ask it to come and land on your hand, but you want to. You have to give it a reason. And I said, the reason is you want to look at the beautiful colours on its wings. So a butterfly came past, put his hand. He asked it, 
it flew by, went out of sight, turned around, came back, and landed on his fingers. So I said, right, right. okay, that's good. Then I said to him, right, what you need to do now, you need to compare, you want to ask it to fly away and come back with a friend. Uh, but you have to give it a reason. And I said, the reason is you, you want to share, uh, see the colours, the different colours on your friend's wings. So it's off. It flew out of sight. It came back. It landed on his fingers and his friend landed on his forehead. So he'd got two butterflies. <laughs> Look at them. And then he had 12 butterflies landing on him that day. He'd been there four or five years, four years probably, and he'd just been watching them flying by like this. <laughs> uh, and awesome. then I think the, the following day or the day after, he said to his wife, uh, Lorraine, come outside. We'll go and ask the butterflies to come and land on you. So they went outside. He must have said the same process. And I've got photographs. I've got photographs of all this because he sent me them. And the, awesome. his wife's got these butterflies all the way up her arm. And he'll be reading a book. And they'll come and land on his book, or they'll land on his foot, or they'll land on his glasses. You know, they just land everywhere now because he's using consciousness as a conduit for communication. And he reached out to them. And uh, uh, But we don't understand we have those abilities, but we do because that's we're all part of that shared consciousness. Yes, and we see some of that, I think, with um, when we see the ships, the, the UAPs or UFOs, um, in the sky as well, because we do have communication with them as well. Without exactly. without a doubt, yes. We uh, yeah. uh, Just like the butterfly, you're using thought and consciousness. If you want to see a craft, you can use thought and consciousness as the uh, conduit for the telepathic communication. And the majority of my communication now is telepathic, but I've learned over the years uh, to be comfortable and confident with that telepathic communication. Because as I was learning it, I believe we all have these abilities. Uh, they just get quashed because we don't develop them. We don't use them. Uh, so they fade away. But every time I uh, was given some information in a download, or uh, I was uh, uh, given some telepathic information, I would ask them on one occasion, they gave me the download of the quantum unified field theory which I, I knew nothing about. And they just gave me it in an instant. For the viewers that don't know what the download is, it's a, a large amount of information just in a split second. Uh, and that's what they did. So it's just given to you, using consciousness as a conduit for the information. So what I, I did on that occasion, I said, uh, you've just given me all this information about the quantum unified field theory, which I know nothing about. Uh, can you confirm that the information has come from you by showing you me a craft uh, and a craft appeared immediately. So I went inside to get my wife and uh, I said, Sandy, come outside quick. There's a craft. Here. She came outside. I have a pool here with a full net. Here. We went outside the pool cage and then a second craft appeared. Three, four, five, seven in total appeared. Flew wow. silently over our heads, not very high, 500 feet or so. Uh, and then changed direction by about 80 degrees, and then they disappeared sequentially and had they arrived, as they arrived. So that was a confirmation of the download. And another one, they gave me a download of the theory of everything, really just explaining consciousness, really, from our scientific perspective of it. And mm -hmm. uh, on this occasion, I was sat on my own back and back, uh, and uh, uh, I said, uh, they gave me the information. So I said, can you show me a craft? as confirmation that it's you and not my own imagination. Uh, craft appeared immediately just outside the pool cage and it flashed one, two, three times. So that was confirmation. Well, if you do that all your life in relation to when you receive, and I ask for different things, uh, or sometimes I got downloads about other things and it's night time. I'll ask them if they'll turn the street light off and the street light goes off immediately or vice versa. I get information during the daylight hours. I'll say, right, just give me this information. Can you turn that street light on? And the street light will come on. So when you do that, you're very comfortable with the uh, communication that you have. And I know on one occasion, oh, quite a few years ago, this is another lesson that they gave me with an experience. I was, uh, I was sat watching TV. It was about 10 o'clock. And uh, at that time, I had uh, about a dozen or so chickens. And every night I have to lock them in because the coyotes will come around and steal them. Uh, and I'm sat there and I think, 
And I always close it when it gets dark. So they all just wander back in, sit on the roofs, and then I just go and close the door so nobody can get in. And uh, I got this thought, and part was, did I lock the chickens in? I thought, oh, I better go check. Because if I don't go check, and I didn't, and I've no chickens left on. So I got up, I went out, uh, I walked up to the chickens, and uh, the door was locked. But then the street light went off. And then there was a second street light, and that went off. I thought, I bet there's a craft in the area. So I looked up, and there's this big triangular craft, about 400 feet or so, all lit up like a Christmas tree. That was a lesson in telepathic communication. They gave me the thought, but I had to act upon it to complete the lesson, as it were. And uh, fairly simplistic, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, so if we take notice of our thoughts, I know mm -hmm. we have our own thoughts as well, but uh, the telepathic communication is a great form of communication. Again, using, uh, this is why I can ask them a question. I remember speaking to a guy uh, from Canada. I went down to a, a MUFON conference. That's another story, but uh, a MUFON conference in Orlando. And when I was there, I met this Canadian engineer. And he said to me, Kevin, do you know anything about the propulsion systems that the ETs use, the anti-gravity ones? I said, no, I don't. Uh, I th he said, well, what, can you ask them? I said, yeah, I can ask them. I'll ask them and see what they say. So I got his email and everything. And then uh, uh, I asked. And as I asked for the information, I got a download of how one of these uh, uh, anti-gravity propulsion systems works. So I wrote it all down, sketched it down. I'm not a very good sketcher, but, uh, and I sent it to him. But I, uh, I, I read the information. And to me, it made sense. And they had an explanation with the diagrams of how it worked and the electromagnetic fields that they used and how it was using the Earth's uh, uh, magnetic center, as it were, and repelling like two magnets. And that's how they did it. That's how they, uh, but it was quite fascinating that they gave me this diagram. Thing. So we're, we're able to do that. And once you, you're comfortable and happy with that, that's why we should take notice of our thoughts. If you ask for something, then you have to take notice of what's coming back to you. For sure. And I think that, you know, a lot of people, they they don't realize that they're getting telepathic communication all the time. They that's, think it's just their thoughts. They and, do, yes. And, and that's the beauty of uh, once you understand telepathic communication. And then you, I can have a two-way conversation, just I'm sure you can, just by sat here now. They may even just give me some information while I'm sat here. And then uh, uh, it, sometimes they'll give me information to convey to other people. And I found that difficult in the past because uh, it's very, uh, uh, if you, <laughs> especially if it's from a deceased person as well. It, but I have passed the messages on and they've always been beneficial to the people that received them. Yeah. Uh, but it's the same. Makes them get used effect. to. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. And very often they'll put some information in there that the uh, only the person who's receiving the information will understand that because it's been something personal that's given to them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, but again, it's that understanding of consciousness. And that's why the mediums who connect with the uh, people, the deceased family and friends, all they're doing is reaching out through consciousness and making that contact. Well, uh, that's part of my education as well. Only, you know, I went out to meet them as well, going back 30 generations. But yeah. that was part of the education. So I fully understand how the mediums do it. And I say, by them, uh, I've had a couple of, uh, two or three, where I've had to convey messages from deceased families. And for people who I don't know sometimes, and, I, you know, it's very difficult to uh, uh, convey a message to someone who you don't know from a deceased person who he didn't know either. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, but there again, that was, they gave me that, uh, when they gave me that message, oh, it's a long while ago now, it was a message for Dr. Stephen Greer, and uh, I'd, I'd heard of it. And uh, I, I said I'd convey the message. Anyway, when I came back to my body from traveling in that craft with them, I woke up in bed and I wrote the message down, who it was for, his name, time and date, whatever, because I always make records. And uh, I woke up in the morning and looked at the note and I thought, I'm a, I don't know this man. How can I say 
I am travelling on the astral plane. And when a, a conscious craft comes alongside, and there's two extraterrestrials in there travelling as the pure conscious energy orbs, he'll think I'm a nutter. So I screwed it up. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. And I threw it in the trash bin. And then the following night, I went to bed. And uh, um, they contacted me in a dream, another modality, both R and D. They came and they said, it's very important you convey this message to Dr. Stephen Greer. And I didn't know him. I knew of him, but I didn't know him. And uh, so I thought, oh, right. then they gave me a reason why. So I thought, right, I'd better convey the message. But how am I going to do it? Mm -hmm. so I went on to uh, YouTube and I put his name in. And the first video that came up on the top right hand side was Dr. Stephen Greer doing a presentation for a press conference in Washington, D.C. And sat next to him was a police officer. I didn't know him either, but I knew of him, a guy called Gary Hesseltine. So I thought, well, there's a connection. And he worked in the similar area to where I worked as a police officer, or I didn't know him, it was a different section. So uh, I contacted him by email. I thought, well, I can't put all this in an email. I'll uh, I'll get his phone number and I'll phone him. So I phoned him. I gave him the message. And uh, 20 minutes later, Dr. Stephen Greer replied by email to Gary. Gary conveyed it to me. He thanked me for the information, said he would take it under uh, advisement. And when they he gave me that information, I said to them, who shall I say the message is from? And they said, tell Dr. Stephen Greer it's from the light beings. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that term. So I conveyed that, that in the message. And then when he replied to the message by, by Gary, by the email, he put a photograph of a light being that he had seen while he was out in the field doing some research. So that was my confirmation. But I felt like Absolutely. the weight was lifted on my shoulders because, you know, for a total stranger, to come and say, hey, I've been traveling outside my body on the astral plane, meeting with extraterrestrials. You know, the normal person would think you're just a lunatic, but because he's got his own contact anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I've never met him. That's the only com uh, information. I'll, I'll contact with him. I'll follow what he does. But, uh, um, yeah, just uh, uh, But I did ask them. I said, oh, you know, why did you give me such a difficult um, message to convey to somebody in such a manner. And they said, Kevin, we wanted to see if you would convey messages from us. But it gave me a moral dilemma because they said that if uh, it didn't change his uh, itinerary on a specific day, some harm might come to him or he might even die. Mm. And I thought, well, if I don't tell him, if I don't convey the message and something happens to him, I'd never come you know, I'll never, never be able to forgive, forgive yourself. Myself. Yeah. Never forgive myself. And I, uh, so it was a moral dilemma. I thought, well, if I if I do contact him and give him the information and he thinks I'm a lunatic, I can put up with that. <laughs> it won't bother me. Yeah. Uh, but when I did, I did convey the message and got it back. So it was a, a, a moral conflict I had. And uh, obviously to see if I would convey messages from them. Yeah. And, and I'm sure they do that on purpose with other experiences. They'll give them parts of the information. So they've got to do some work themselves to mm -hmm. get to the end goal, the end result. It's all part of that education, really. Uh, I mean, looking back, I shouldn't have been so hesitant. And uh, I'm, as I say, I've had other messages I've conveyed to people. But now, if they want to uh, speak to people, say, in our government, they can use me as an emissary, as a go-between, I'm sure. And uh, I'm, they already asked me to reach out quite a few years ago to the United Nations and uh, in relation to a mandated protocol to see if we had one and receive the ETs. And at yeah. that time, I contacted the office of Nicholas Hedman, the Outer Space, Outer, Affairs, Outer Space Affairs Committee chairman, who was at that time. I don't know whether he still is. And, and I asked him if there was a, a mandated protocol to receive the extraterrestrials. And he did respond. He said that uh, we don't have a mandated protocol in place at the moment in time should advanced extraterrestrials wish to communicate with the UN. So uh, yeah, I like the way he used the word advanced. And I was surprised that it responded to my uh, uh, my communication. But, but nothing materialised from that. But I was able, I was comfortable reaching out. And I don't mind saying now that 
I have contact with uh, extraterrestrials because there are many people reaching out. In fact, I saw one just this recently, yesterday, uh, Chris Bledsoe. He was interviewed with, on Jeff Marr's podcast, YouTube podcast, about his contact. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. if, if anybody hasn't seen that, you need to watch it. I think he had 48,000 views. So the information is coming from the extraterrestrials through the experiences and sharing that information. So that's well worth the watch. I was very impressed with the interview and the information. And I understood the information. And he mentioned, somebody mentioned about how did uh, he communicate with them. And he said he used prayer. But prayer is thought. So he's yeah. really it's using tele telepathic, telepathic communication. He yeah. just didn't fully understand that at that moment. So prayer is thought. Prayer is telepathic communication to the higher levels of consciousness. So it, it's all the same information. But yeah, a fascinating interview. And it's nice to see so many people speaking out now and speak a lot of experiences. And again, uh, many, many years ago, we were, uh, we'd be ostracized for speaking out. Well, I never did. Uh, it wasn't until about four years ago. It was only my, uh, some of my close friends, my brother and my wife that knew of my contact. And uh, four years ago, I was, I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I came back from the bathroom and uh, I got into bed. I was just about to snuggle down and the bright light appeared outside the bedroom window. The light shone into the bedroom. It came through the window and the whole bedroom lit up like a myriad of white butterflies. It was just pure mm. white light. And then all the, they materialized at the bottom of the bed. And after pleasantries, I said, uh, you know, what's the reason for your visit? And they said, Kevin, we want you to talk about your lifelong contact with us. We want you to write about your lifelong contact. I said, well, I don't mind talking about it, but I'm not a writer. And Art said, uh, uh, well, we will continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you. Uh, in fact, Kevin, you will write two books and we'll give you information to include in the books. I've written one now and had that published. Uh, so I'm working on the second one. But uh, um, I mean, that contact is just, amazing but now i speak openly about it because it's happening to so many others so yeah. i'm not part of the small percentage now the percentage of people having the contact is getting bigger and bigger and they're giving more and more information out to people so uh it's clearly the uh my group of att's they refer to it as the reveal that's my mission here to help facilitate the reveal globally of their ambassadors and that's part of my work now that's what i'm doing that's why it's led me to to this day and i'm working with uh, uh, rebecca hartcat wright and her exo conscious community there's a whole community there of people who have their own understanding of consciousness they have their own contact and when we get together as a group and share that information there's a huge amount of information and contact and connection there with the higher conscious beings, the extraterrestrial. Uh, it's just uh, truly amazing, yeah. That's awesome. So, in fact, sorry, I'll, I'll just no, go mention, one of the group, uh, Kareen, she's had exactly the same scientific downloads in relation to the quantum unified field theory. She saw me talking about it on a podcast somewhere and I was explaining, I went into the whole explanation of it. And what I said, was the exact words, words that she received in the download. So it's funny how uh, these things go full circle. She's now uh, a major part of uh, Rebecca's exoconscious community, and we're, we're all still continuing to receive information. We're sharing that information. We're becoming the emissaries for the extraterrestrials. So I think that's quite interesting uh, it, development in that. And that's because we're all following our path of how uh, of why we are here to help with this um, monumental event, which will change humanity's direction uh, for time to come. So, and so, what information have you been given about this reveal, Kevin? Have you have they given you any kind of information about the reveal? Right. Yes. They what they say now. They've approached our governments on numerous occasions. Mm -hmm. Our governments are not prepared to, at this moment, act upon it. They may do in the future. 
So now they've decided they've changed tack and the reveal will come from a request from these citizens of Earth. And I suspect these citizens of Earth will be the many groups like your group, uh, many galactic ambassadors like yourself, like Rebecca Hardcastle's group, uh, XO Conscious Community. They will all come together and their emissaries within those groups will reach out to our ET star families and they will respond to that. As they are doing with Chris Bledsoe, he goes outside now, asks them to show the craft, the craft turn up, the film crews are there to uh, to film it. So we're moving forward uh, quite rapidly. In fact, he said on his uh, the podcast I watched yesterday that the, he's on the History Channel. Well, that's fascinating because how many people watch that? Thousands, millions probably. So Absolutely. We're, we're all being guided now towards uh, the reveal itself. And that's my mission here. That's always been my mission. Mm -hmm. But first they have to educate me in, relation to consciousness and reaching out and communicating with them, which they have done. And uh, and, and now with everybody else or connecting with them, we're raising our collective consciousness as a species because as people see them uh, or see the UFOs, it, it activates something within our DNA system uh, that allows us to expand our own consciousness to see them. And, and that's the key. We are, our own thoughts inhibit who we are. If you can open the mind and expand those thoughts, then those thoughts expand your reality, expand your consciousness. And then, if there's enough people do that, we expand our collective consciousness as a human species. And that's that's what's happening. And I see it happening quickly now. It's expanding rapidly, exponentially, yes. so we say, because uh, if I. I, I'll, I'll go to a local restaurant and I'll start chatting with somebody at the bar or something. And uh, the, the, they all seem interested in it now. It's out there in the public. It's it in is. the public domain. Uh, I remember a couple of weeks ago, so, <laughs> talking to this guy, and I'd mentioned it before, and he was not, never interested. And then he, he said to me, did you see that on the news about that new conference that's going on? Mm -hmm. That new committee that the Congress are doing about new folks. I said, Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Wow, he says. <laughs> so the information is filtering down, filtering through. And uh, like I say, uh, we, the experiences are the emissaries, all that, I'm sure. Yeah. So I like the word emissary. I know that because <laughs> my understanding of consciousness is all these different levels that we have. And mm -hmm. we'll go all the way up with the different species, different life forms up to the angelic realm, up to the watchers, up to source energy. That's my understanding of consciousness. Yes. And uh, a friend of mine who has contact with the angelic realms, with Archangel Uriel, Archangel Michael, Archangel Abraham, and uh, one other, I forget the other one now. And uh, she got a message from them, for me, and at that time I had met her, not physically, but on Zoom and things. And... Uh, she said she'd been given the information that, uh, Kevin, you are an emissary for the extraterrestrials. Well, I'm thinking, wow, I've never thought about that before. So now I, I, keep, yeah. I, keep, I keep using that word. I think it's right. But I don't think it just refers to me. I think it refers to all the experiences. They're all the emissaries for the extraterrestrials. It's not just me. I've just been given that one piece of information, that one word. But that word is very important because it reflects uh, and refers to all the experiences. We are all the emissaries. And that's why we've been taught. And we're all at different levels of understanding of it and the different experiences that we have. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's very exciting times. And uh, I've been told that we are moving towards the golden years for humanity yeah. um, with new technologies, shared technologies. And uh, so, yeah, it's a great time to be alive and to see this happening. It's not going to be easy because a lot of people don't want it. There's the evil yeah. side of consciousness that will try and stop this. But there has to be, within consciousness itself, there is an evil, there is a good. And when it's in balance... It's all about balance. It's all about balance. When it's in balance, the good can come through. If we're out of balance, then the evil is coming through on the other side. And we've seen that these past few years in relation to uh, what's been happening on our planet uh, what's been happening to the people. So 
hopefully we can get that balance back again and yeah. uh, allow the the goodness of humanity to come back through. And I'm sure it will. Uh, we've had these upheavals in the past. The Indeed. different walls we've had, they that's when the evil has, has risen its head and uh and it, it does go back to that balance. But it's uh, easier if you have an understanding of it in relation to how do we get back to that equilibrium, that balance of uh, uh consciousness, which is what it is really. Because don't forget, we are creating it. Those evil people are creating that reality using thought and consciousness. Now, mm-hmm. whether they know they're doing that on purpose. I would, if they do, then they're really, really evil people. If they're doing it accidentally, then, uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But that's why our thoughts are so important in relation to being positive, being kind uh, to to everybody, plants, trees, the animals, and everything. Absolutely. I mean, love is the key to a lot it of is. this. Yes. Well, I was told that love is one of the highest vibrational frequencies of consciousness. It is. Well, I mean, that's just, uh, and, and I know people that reach out on, with these CE5 groups, uh, those are groups that go out into the, the backyard with family and friends and just ask the ETs to show themselves. And mm-hmm. uh, and they do do, but they say that you've got to show love and respect for them. Uh, and then because those energies of conscious conscious love go out to the, through the universe, and then they'll show themselves, they'll show their craft and things. I know uh, Costa McCreese now, he has uh, uh, etletstalk.com, and he yeah. has over a million people within the different groups now going out and reaching out to our East ET staff on this, and they'll show up, a craft will appear, they'll flare up, flare down, and some people get telepathic communications. Uh, I know a couple just recently that have had them and they've been touched on the knee, touched on the shoulder. The next step, that physical contact of the ETs touching them and... Uh, so yeah, it's um, uh, like I say, a fascinating, fascinating time to be here and to witness it, really. And it's I, for me, I just I'm I feel so honored to be able to be part of the process for everybody. In, I, w- in I would agree that. with that. It is. I mean, <laughs> we put a lot of work into it, don't we? And all the experiences they put. I was speaking to another group the other day, and one lady was saying that you know she needs a break. She's been doing this for about oh, twenty years or more, and uh, but sometimes. There's so much work to do. There's always the next step, always the next step. So, But like you said earlier, uh, uh, Tannis, it's a labour of love. And, Absolutely. Uh, and what a great job, opportunity to be a part of it and, and to see it unfold as it is doing, and that's just great. Yeah. And many of us have done this for many lifetimes already as well. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's so. true. I remember, I've got, uh, I remember three past lives. I remember two past deaths. Because they were violent. One, one, I was a, a Knights Templar, and I was fighting at the Battle of Agincourt, and uh, and they were fighting the Moors, and I didn't even know that that, that battle existed really. So uh, when I remembered that as a child, I went back and explored it using thought of consciousness, mm-hmm. and uh, I, they'd, they'd got a new, I developed a new arrow tip, new technology, and that arrow tip pierced my armor because it was a new metal they were using. And it went straight mm. into my heart and I died. And I remember that. And I remembered it because of it violent. And then the other one, I was a royalist in the um, oh, in France. Uh, and uh, there was a big storming of the Bastille, 1789, something like that. And they came and raided our house. And because we were a royalist, we were all put in the back of the car and carted off to the Bastille. And I had my head chopped off. Oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm so and sorry I to hear that. <laughs> I know, and I explored that. I explored that as a child. I was thinking, at first, I thought it was a dream. Yeah. And I thought, so when I woke up, when the guillotine was coming down, I thought, of course, oh, what's going to happen when if that guillotine chops off my head, will I die? And I thought, oh, and then I woke up, I didn't die. So yeah. at school that day, I'm thinking, I'm going to go back into that dream. I'm going to go and explore that. I want to know. If I die in a dream, do I die in this physical reality? And I think I was about 11 at that time. Mm-hmm. So I went <laughs> I went to bed. I got back into that time scale, that past life. I lived through it. Only this time, I was watching it as a third party. Because right. I'd already seen it unfold. Yeah. And it got to the point where the guillotine was coming down. And I wanted to know, A, would I die in a dream? 
and B, could I see in the basket where my head fell off? So the guillotine came down, chopped my head off. I saw in the basket for about four seconds. I didn't wake up, but I woke up the following morning and it answered the fact that, you know, if you're dying a dream, you don't die in this reality. So, but, but there is say. And then the other one, I was a, a, a priest in the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. And, mm. uh, I liaised between the seven sisters. Uh, at that time, who were guiding uh, humanity and uh, the societies at that time. So I remember that, and I remember the avenue of uh, uh, pillars, because that led down to their quarters where the seven sisters uh, lived, as it were. And I was the only person that was allowed to go in there to get their messages to spread to the leaders and things. So I suppose it's a bit similar to what I'm doing now, really, conveying messages from different people uh, just a communicator, just a messenger. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, but I think sometimes the past lives that we have are um, uh, educators to what we're going to be doing in the next life. And because I've been educated in this life, and the no doubt as a nice Templar, no doubt as a, a young royalist, I was only about fourteen when that happened to me. Uh, that um, um, that education helps us where we are now at this moment in time. So uh, in relation to understanding that consciousness continues to live on and you can create a new reality. And I've even been shown my next incarnation. Yes. And uh, I, I think that's, and I've met others that have seen their next incarnation as well. So I think that's really just part of the education in yeah. understanding that the true life form uh, throughout the universe is consciousness itself. And we manifest that consciousness as a physical reality. Uh, that was my understanding of them, uh, all that they've taught me, really. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's basically what I've been taught as well. So Okay, well, I, I can and I am finding that, actually. The more people I speak to, we've all been taught the same stuff. We have. Maybe slightly different angle to it, a little bit yeah. more, maybe a little bit left out. But we've all been taught the same stuff. It's just, uh, and that in itself gives you uh, confidence and uh, yeah. to speak out about it because others reinforce it. It's just fascinating, yeah. really. And especially with Kareem, you know, I mean, the downloads that I've had, exactly the same. And she questioned them. She didn't know whether it was uh, her own mind that was making them up until she heard my talk. And then she realized that uh, there's something more to this than meets the eye. So, and then she joins uh, the back group and uh, uh, we're all working together now, so it's just uh, uh, fascinating, really. absolutely fascinating. And, and that is key, right? The collaboration it is, amongst it is. humanity. I think that has been a big, big theme for many of us is the collaboration, not just not just for our purpose in terms of the the um, you know our our the reveal of ETs and all, but I think in general it's a huge theme for all yes. of us. To learn yeah, cooperation and unconditional love. I yeah. think those are the biggest themes. They are, yeah, I, I would agree with that. And uh, and like I say, it's really about, it's not about the ETs. It's about humanity. It's mm -hmm. about our evolution. We have to evolve as a species to understand who we are. And That's then true. the technologies will come, the we share technologies. But it's about our evolution, not the ETs. They're just the... They've still got their lives anyway, but yeah. those that are here to help us to evolve uh, with an understanding of consciousness and as a species, so we become a benevolent species towards one another. Which we, exactly. We need, learn, we need to learn to do that first and stop having the wars. And, the, and we are a, a, a tribal system, aren't we? we? We cherish our lands, cherish our cultures, but we need to integrate them and become... Uh, one humanity really. we need to cherish those but also cherish each other exactly the same exactly way. so yeah and then we're we're on that path i mean some of the religions teach that anyway the eastern religions are, uh, I, I haven't studied them a little bit and uh, they teach that but in the west we've lost all that so we went down the materialist scientist route and yeah. we lost all that so we've got to regain that first and then move forward and uh like i say i'm, I'm quite excited for the future uh, to see what what happens and and it's it's the individuals that are working towards it all those groups the group that you belong to 
uh, there's the many other groups that I many. speak with, and yeah. they're, they're all working towards the same thing. Well, they'll all come together and with that collective consciousness, and then we, the emissaries, the experiences, can reach out collectively to the ETs. And we already know we can ask them to show their craft, because I do that. Uh, yeah. Other people do that. It's, it's common for experiences to do that. And uh, we we just really need to extend it then. It shows the craft, can you come down and land? We want to meet with you. We, our emissaries want to meet with your ambassador. Exactly. And, uh, that's, where, that's where we're headed, so. Absolutely. Sure. And, and I, I hope I, hope I have be, been. Go ahead. <laughs> I hope to be there to greet them. I'm sure that you will be. I'm sure that <laughs> this is this is your mission as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that uh, I was called into a meeting there in in uh, in energy form um, to speak with two groups of people. It was part of a committee two weeks oh, ago. Lovely. Um, and uh, there was a conversation between a group of Pleiadians and a group of Octurians about, um, you know, the, the Pleiadians were like, let's go see them, let's go see them. And the Octurians <laughs> were like, we have a process. Yeah. We have a process. <laughs> so there's talks going on about our progression and how we're doing, indeed. So I, I, I suspect they're as excited as, as we are because yeah. they realize what we can evolve to and how we Indeed. can uh, eliminate all our wars, our poverty, our famine, and protect the earth because our polar pollution, we're killing the earth. And when you think the earth is conscious itself as well. Yeah. So we we have to, and there's sufficient resources here to, uh, I always see this as a spaceship and the spaceship has humanity on it. And mm. uh, But we have to take care maintain that spaceship and it will look after us so at the moment we're neglecting it we're abusing it and we need to uh and i know my ets are always telling me how concerned they are about the pollution and they're particularly concerned about the fukushima pollution you know, the radiation that's still leaking into the uh, oceans there so uh let's and they're prepared to share some of their technologies to help uh clean some of that radioactive pollution up so uh but uh, hopefully they will do that once when you reach out to them and uh, ask them to reveal themselves globally. But then we need ambassadors like yourself to meet with them, to convey information, and then create that new society. And there are many working towards it. But I'm I'm sure there must be many within the political systems, but they don't come forward yet because they don't want to be ridiculed, which yeah. is understandable. I can come forward and. Uh, speak of my experiences because I don't mind being ridiculed and uh, you know I've got a mission to do so I'll just take it as it comes as it were but if you're in an important position in a political position then it must be difficult to speak out uh, I'm sure. this moment then. so yeah so we can speak out for them and then when they're That's in a position to take over uh, the politicians then we can do that as long as they have an understanding that we need to change direction and uh, evolve uh, as species, as humanity. Exactly. So final thoughts, Kevin. Final thoughts? Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. There are many working towards it. We will have a positive outcome. We will have those golden years for humanity. It will come from the people. It will come from the citizens of Earth. Our political structures have collapsed at the moment, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we need to rebuild them. Uh, and we, the experiences, the emissaries, the ambassadors are here to help with that. So, yes, exciting times ahead uh, for our species, for humanity. Indeed, indeed. So I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your amazing story and, and all of the work you do. Um, thank you from all of us. Uh, on earth and uh thank you for joining us for this uh this podcast it's been well, thank you for yeah. invi inviting me tanis it's i've enjoyed chatting with you and we chatted for about 20 Likewise. minutes before we started recording so we have we so did. much in common it's just amazing so but thank you again for inviting me because without people like you doing your work uh, i cannot get that message out so you're a very important part of this process of the reveal itself yeah. so thank you Thank you. And thank you all for watching this podcast of 
Galactic the bridge to the galaxy we're so happy that you joined us and uh, please come back again for the next one we'll see you soon